Did you go? <laughs> and we're going to get started on our lesson for today. So uh, let's, uh, let's, let's pray and we'll, we'll get started pretty shortly. So, Father, we thank you again uh, for this day. Thank you for the opportunity uh, that we always have to call you our Father and us being your children and your servants. Thank you so much for all you provide and sustain us with. Thank you for just your love and your provision that you give in our lives. Help us continue to see your hand in all things, good or bad, valley or mountaintop experiences, and thank you for it all. Reminding us that as the Jewish people went through their high holy days and remembered their Rosh Hashanah, the Yom Kippur, we also remember our always fresh new start every day, every every moment with you, we can be forgiven of our sins. And every opportunity we have to always remember you paid for that debt for us. So help us to always be having short accounts, uh, having us to be searching our ways. You search the ways out within us, weed out the wicked ways. And Father, be with us in each and every way. You had the knowing of our needs, of our physical, financial, mental, spiritual. Uh, Father, help us in all ways to be strengthened, edified, and to be encouraged uh, by you. And we ask that you now be our pastor, our teacher, our guide, our shepherd, our counselor, our coming bridegroom. Uh, teach us now into your word. And we ask all these things in Jesus, Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. So don't forget today's Communion Sunday. So if you're online, you forgot about that, please get your elements ready. If people come on later, uh, please remind them of that because we had a delay last week because of our audiovisual problems. I should say more audio than anything else. So now I'm not wearing a, I'm a, a lapel mic or headset mic anymore. But it is clear. I, I heard it. And uh, that's good. So, All right. So today's lesson will be continuously on the irreproachable, blameless, and it's a little, uh, that's my hand out there. Uh, without blemish, I erased some of that by picking up the board. Sorry about that. Um, these are English words in the scripture that speak to more of the Greek words. And as we've come so far to remind you why we're doing this is because these distinctive words have different demarcations of maturity. So it's almost like saying, and, and the best way to explain it to English is we say something like child please or where's the child? You, you, if you say child please, that could be to anybody who's an adult, right? If you say where's the child, you're in your mind thinking an adolescent, right? So we use the word child very loosely and God uses different demarcations of words in the Greek language. There's brephos, nepios, mikros, technon, uh, Oh, excuse me, brephos, mikros, uh, excuse me, I said it wrong, too, too fast. Brephos, nepios, mikros, pation, technon, naniskos, and anir. Those are all the groups, groups of how you grow, just so you know. That's all, not, not my words, those are all in the Bible, by the way. All in the Bible, but they demarcate our physical growth as well as our spiritual growth. Well, if that's in the scripture, then why is it we don't understand there's also demarcations of our spiritual acumen as how God looks at us as being irreproachable, blameless, without, without blemish, or spotless. These are all English renderings, but there's Greek words of amemptos uh, Polyptos that apply only to mature ones. We've seen that. That's in today's vernacular of walking by faith through obedience as a memptos, a memptos on a polyptos, walking within our responsibilities and our roles fit, faithfully. Then on a kleptos, we looked at that being free accusation of men, and that's specifically clear of anybody who was on office in the church uh, and the congregation, I should say. Anybody who's a, a pastor or a deacon or elder has to be on a kleptos. They can't have accusations from men railed at them, so you can't be involved in obviously nefarious things, obviously. So your home life can't be a wreck. You can't have business dealings that are questionable and so on and so on. Your neighbor shouldn't say, I could just want to run over my cat. He will never confess it. Things like that are not good. You can't have people accusing you of stuff because that's not good. So if they do, then wait, well, I can't prevent that. You can't prevent false accusation. However, you can make peace with them. We talked about Jesus was falsely accused. doesn't matter how you live. He was obviously perfect. And they accused him of all kinds of crazy things, right? So you can't be free of accusation, but you can't. You have to be free of the, uh, of the truthful accusation. So if there's any meat on the bones at all to that accusation, you have to see that for what it is. And even though it comes from a nefarious, evil human being, filtering that as a mature person is hard to do. We talked about that as well. And then uh, aspilos is when you're not affected or infected by the the, the root of the word, the <coughs> excuse me, the world meaning the people of the covenant folks or even the corrupt world as a general. So the cosmos means people of covenant and then cosmos is those that are not of covenant. So just so you would refresh you on that. So when you see the word world in scripture, it means all humanity. And then the world is an article that emphasizes those within that world of the covenant people. That's who he came to save, right? He, he for God so loved the world, the people of covenant. And so that's what that was about. So we talked about that. And then we, we're going to move on. We got didn't get a chance to do that yet. Now we're going to be on the um, amomatos, amomatos, excuse me, amomos, and the other version of anakletos. To remind you, anakletos is written twice because the anakletos we covered already was the free of accusation from men. The other anakletos, it still means free of accusation, but this time it's from God. 
So that's why you can never obtain eikolitos in this life. That's impossible. God's always going to have something against you. You can have a sin in your life. There's no such thing as being sinless, right? So now we're going to go over to uh, the, uh, um, excuse me, I say the word? A momentos. So go to uh, Philippians 2.15. If you go to Philippians 2.15, you'll see it means to be freed from the consequence, from the, the consequence, um, no, excuse me, that's this one. Freed, uh, blameless, apart from sin, excuse me. Apart from sin. Blameless meaning to be apart from sin. It's going to be used as amemptoi, or momentos, in Philippians 2.15. But for context, in verse uh, 12 to 15, 12, he talks about working out your salvation with fear and trembling. Verse 13, God's effectually working in and, in and in amongst you to do his good will. But then in verse 20, he says, do all things without murmurings and disputing. So he's talking about working out your salvation, Philippians 2.12. God's working in you. Don't murmur. Then in verse 15, that you may be blameless, on memtoi, and inoffensive. And that means to be, again, not a person who has any harm or things about you that are causing harm to others. So you're blameless. You're apart from sin. No one can accuse you of engaging in a, in a sinful lifestyle. So are you a sinner? Yes. But you should not be accused of being in sinful activities, being accused of being engaging in sinful a, uh, actions. So if someone, and that's why the scripture is clear in Romans when he says the weaker and stronger brother uh, concept. He said, well, that's not sinful to me. It, it doesn't matter. Do you want to be viewed as a memtos in the eyes of God? Then another person can't say, well, that's a sin to me. Well, then it's up to you. You want to dig down and say, well, I have a right to do this. You may have the right to do that, but is it the right thing to do? And that's the difference. So that's why this amemtos, amomentos, excuse me, amomentos speaks to you actually having the decision to make, is it the right, is it, is it the right thing to do? Just because it's my right to do it? Sometimes you have a right to do something. doesn't mean it's the right thing to do. Like I have a right to discipline my child. Is it the right thing to do in front of their friends? It depends you know, on, on how off the rails they are going. I don't know. Usually you want to discipline privately and, and then praise publicly, right? It's the old adage. But very rarely do you discipline publicly unless it really is just something that you just have to do. But that's something that's, for example, uh, you have to gauge how, how, what do you want to be involved in? So, so well, I, I'm doing this activity and that activity. And so you say, well, that, that's sinful to me. Well, well, that's a narrow-minded bonehead. Yeah, but are they a person in your life and your family and the congregation of God that now has this consequence in their life? They, they think that if you're supposed to be this godly person and you're engaging in X, Y, Z, then they don't get that. So then they're going, well, then how can you be apart from sin? In their mind, you're engaging in sin. So in their mind, you're not a momentos. So if they can view it that way, then God says, weaker and stronger brother, don't forget about that. You should be willing to change whatever your actions are to make peace with your brother and not have this accusation that you're engaged in a sinful lifestyle or action or continuous type situation. 2 Peter 3.14, this word only appears twice, a momentos. 2 Peter 3.14, uh, we see it again. And this, this time we see it, 2 Peter 3.14, in reference to the preparations of what Peter calls the day of the Lord, day of God. And he sums up by talking about those two different days, about the new heaven and new earth in verse 13. And 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 14, he says, therefore, meaning therefore because of this Lord not wanting us to all be perish. He doesn't want anyone to perish, meaning all of his kids. He wants no one to discover the loss of reward, the loss of intimacy, and therefore incur destruction. As a child of God, you can incur destruction. We go, what? Yes, that's what Peter said. The Lord does not want that for you in verse 9, 2 Peter 3, which churchianity just misinterprets that. Oh, God wants nobody to be going to hell. That's not what he's talking about. It's a letter written to the matured saints. And again, I love how people want to ignore. Again, if I was writing a letter and I wrote, to my wife, right? And it, for example, Peter wrote the letter in chapter 1 of Second Peter, the very first verse, Simon Peter, a bond servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who don't know Jesus is. No, to those who have obtained an equally precious faith. How do you not understand who, who he's talking to? What, are you blind? Are you deaf? I mean, it's unbelievable. It's right there to read it. If you don't read it, you can hear it. And yet Jesus is telling you through Peter, this is who I'm talking to. And yet, yet preachers will read it and they'll speak it and then go over to chapter 3, verse 9. He's talking to the whole world. Then might go to hell. That's not what he said. You're lying. He's addressing the people with equal life, precious faith. He said it. It's not my fault and it's his fault that you ignore that and go to a scripture that makes it fit into some thing that you have been traditionally brainwashed into thinking. It means stop doing that. Check yourself. Every tradition should be on trial. Don't believe a tradition because it's been handed down to you. Stop and ask yourself, why do I believe that? Who's that letter written to anyways? The very first verse of the first chapter. In other words, if I was writing a letter, I'd say, Dear Michelle. And then you wrote it, Sarah, and you go, he's talking to me. How could you possibly? 
I'm not talking to you. I said, dear Michelle, what are you talking about? What are you talking, how do you not, how do you, what? Now you can apply how I'm talking in a nicety saying, it was always great seeing you today. Well, he's, he's, that means if he's like saying that to her, he's great seeing me too. Okay, you can say that, you can extrapolate that, but the specifics that I'm saying to Michelle are for Michelle, but not for you. If you were to say that, to me is disrespectful, irreverent, and just arrogant to actually think that you have the right to apply a letter, not written to you, as if it's written to you. And then change the whole, you, you change the whole tenor of what their letter was about. Imagine if I die, I wrote a letter to my wife, a loving letter about I wanted to have her here at my last, I'm dying in my deathbed, and she takes a bathroom break, but I'm realizing, uh-oh, my heart's slowing down, I'm gonna die. So I wrote, I wrote the last couple of words, and then all of a sudden everybody reads it, and, he, and they go, he's writing that to me. You know how offensive that is, I was alive, I heard you say that, I'd be extremely offended. I'm talking to my wife, how dare you? Take it and say I'm talking to you. Are, you. are you out of your mind? This is what people do in the Bible. I mean, this is why Jesus said you cannot take away from. You cannot take away from. You cannot take away from God's word. You're taking away when you're ignoring the audience he wrote to. I can't belabor that enough. Now, back in verse 14 of 2 Peter 3, he says, Therefore, beloved, of all these things, therefore, beloved, because of the day of the Lord, day of God, because we're supposed to be walking in reverence with it. He said, therefore, diligently endeavor, again, to be really, really striving, with all your might and heart, he says, and mind, soul, and spirit, to be found, which means through, through searching, he's in a search for you, in peace, spotless, which is aspilos, and he says also blameless. A momentos. So he says it in both sides. So there's this spotless and a momentos. So these are all these things up here, you can only really kind of, uh, <laughs> these things down here, you can have this uh, partial. Uh, fulfillment of Anacletos, Hospilos in some way, but the fulfillment of all this up here is fully known when by God. And up here, being apart from sin, he's telling you that God's going to view you in this way. That's what he's talking about. This is the, he says, because we endeavor to be found by him. So who's doing the searching? God. So how can this happen now? It can't happen now. That's later. So God's going to de declare you a momentos later. Not now. He doesn't search you now for that. He searches you later for that, and that's going to be his context here is in the day of inspection, which again, 1 Peter 2.12 mentions that day out ahead, day of inspection, he calls it. So now we're going to go to this other phrasing, almomos. I spent a lot of time on this one because this is where people get confused over, uh, we talked about it Friday night about, oh, everybody in the church is the bride of Christ and everybody's in Jesus. No, 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 it's not. So go to Ephesians chapter 1. And let me show you how this word almomos is used now. So amomatosis, apart from sin, you're blameless apart from sin. Amomos means you're blameless apart from sin and its consequences, which is why Jesus' blood is mentioned as being amomos. He's not only apart from sin, he's apart from all the consequences of sin as well. So in other words, sin itself, he's not a sinner, and the corruption of the world around him did not infect him either. So he wasn't affected, infected, nor was he himself a sinner. He was sinless, perfect, and holy, and as well as in that corrupt world, he sustained that. So he was sinless and the consequences of sin didn't affect him. Either one. So a momos is what, this is also something you can never obtain now, is something that you hope to be in the right position so that God can say to you later, this is what you have, have obtained. But how can you be this? This is only after you've come through what we, I, I, I'll think about Friday. We're going on this side of the board again. But this is when you go through the day of the Lord. At the end of that day of the Lord, that, that day of inspection, then he'll see, do you have your okodomio, your actual dwelling place in the New Jerusalem? You may be entering to live there for a while, but you might not stay there. And this is where we're going to look at this more so. Interesting on Friday night's conversation. But go to Ephesians chapter 1 and look into verse uh, 4. And verse 4 says, even as he chose. The word here for chose is the root word for eklego. People don't understand what this means. And it's the same phrasing he uses later on. And, and earlier on, to say in the gospel accounts, when he says he chose certain people when he did the mina and the pounds, he gave some people the, the silver. It says the, the, he, he gave them silver. In other words, the mina itself has a certain value to it, but the mina in and of itself intrinsically, even as a dollar value, it's intrinsically made of silver. So the word of God has a value to it, but it's intrinsic value of having a truth within truth. People don't understand that. And God gives that to certain people to understand. That's his, that's his right to do that. Hebrews 6, 3, these things we do if God permit. Matthew 13, 11, it's a privilege given unto you to understand these things. I don't, I don't know. The time. There's nobody who has to come some academia that goes, oh, I figured it out. No, you didn't. If you understand anything about God's word, you should thank God 
through the Holy Spirit who made that aware to you because that's who told you that. Not, not a, academia. What's that? Not the academia. Not, 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 not the academia. That's why people like can't say, well, I have a PhD. I went to such and such as a first seminary. I went to this. And, who cares? So what if man taught you? So what? What did the Holy Spirit teach you? Because that's the whole difference. It's a big difference. Only he can teach. He, he's the only one who can teach you the great things of God. So in verse 4 of Ephesians 1, even as he chose, or a clego, us and, and him and before the foundation of the world, that we might be holy, which means agios, meaning set apart, different from, blameless, this is this word, amomos, and in his presence. And his presence meaning right now, in his sight, meaning Captain Opie, as a group, he sees people corporately, he wants to see you and this group, and this grouping as blameless. What grouping is that? He wants people, he's talking, in Ephesians, he's talking about the whole goal of Ephesians is written to these mature folks, getting to the end game of being called out ones. So we're going to skip ahead and see that in just a moment. But for right now, you can see that Ephesians 1, 4 is talking about how he wants us to be apart from sin and its consequences. He wants us to be holy and blameless in his presence. In his presence. In other words, before his, before his sight. Now, go to Ephesians 5, and you'll see really where this is going to take off and have some more explanation for you as to what he means by this. So in Ephesians 5, verse 27, the context is about the whole church in Christ, as they say it in the English language, but it's about the ecclesia, the called out ones in Christ. But go to verse 27. It says that he might place, this is Christ, the, the congregation, the called out ones, by his own side. Glorious, having no spot, which means, that was this word over here, retidia, which means no flaw, no smallest wrong. It's interpreted wrinkle. Yes? Okay, so Ratidia means no flaw, no small wrong. And it's interpreted wrinkle and, and some English renderings. So think about a wrinkle, it shows the flaw. No matter how small your wrinkle is, you, oh, I'm aging, my skin is, well, that's because it's showing a flaw, There's, that's a flaw. So, and, and, and jewelry, they call it like a little um, inclusion on your, on your diamond. He's saying that you can have the smallest inclusion. If you're wondering the, 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 the seas of a diamond, the clarity is what this is coming from, that's what they get that from. The clarity is when there has no inclusion at all. So if you have a pure, no inclusion diamond, that means there's no speck of coal under a loop, you can't see it. So he's telling you, and Ephesians 5, 27, you should have no, you should have, uh, having no spot, which is no wrinkle, no inclusion at all. That means not even the slightest. That, that's, that's it, that, that's crazy. That's you, can't, you can't have anything at all. That, that he can see in you, that, that even the smallest thing. That's crazy. That's, the, that's how he's using the word retidia. It means to have no smallest wrong. You can't say, well, I had this one thing. Would you, then, no, then you're not, you're not retidia. You're not spotless. That's not what he's talking about. It's a different word. But that yeah. seems almost impossible. It is impossible now. But he will make you this way later. Uh, this is talking about okay. at the end of this thousand years in heaven, when you're entering heaven, at the day of inspection, that's how you pass that day of inspection at the end of the day of Christ. So the, the, the day of the Lord's on, on the earth. He's the Messiah, ruling and reigning from earth. But he reigns on the throne of David, but he rules heaven and earth. And as he's ruling heaven and earth, he's reigning from earth on the throne of the Father David. Then when that thousand years is over, then the God the Father, the whole Jer New Jerusalem, sits down on the earth. He then goes into the throne room itself, and the bridegroom takes on that role of bridegroom now. Now the bride is revealed for the first time. Before, she is just procured to the side as known as faithful ones. But then at the end of that thousand years, after the beam of already happened at the beginning, at the end of it, on the earth is the great white throne going on, while in the heavens is a day of inspection going on, because Jesus is down there judging those people, and God the Father's up in heaven doing an inspection, saying, let me see your garment. What garment? Well, the one you gave me? No, not that one. The one you made by your righteous acts, the one in Revelation 19. What? Well, yeah. Well, so, oh, you're the foolish virgin, the one who took the lamp and no extra measure of oil because you thought you're done. Well, guess what? You're not. So you're not done. So there's no extra work you did. That's on you. So you depart from me. What? Yeah. That's not funny. That's why out of darkness has weeping and gnashing of teeth associated with it because you came from a place that you were right there at the precipice of you're in heaven, you're about to get the next step to inherit it, and you're told no. Not only no, you can't ever see this place ever again. By that is awful. No wonder you're weeping and gnashing of teeth. No wonder you're in outer darkness, wondering, kicking yourself, thinking, what an abject moron. What's the word for foolish? Moros, moron. You feel like a moron. Like, how can I get this close and then mess it up? What an idiot, you know? It's just so, it's like, you're that close and you, and you screw up because of how you went into the situation. 
But this is about the end. So he says that no spot or blemish. But he says, or blemish. So again, he talks about this on the, and that's the amomos, the word for uh, blemish there is a different word, rotidia. So, so aspilos and um, rotidia. And then he goes in such things, but this you might be holy and blameless. The blameless is amomos. So I want you to see this amomos is this, is the Ephesians 5.27. But it takes into to account, okay, let's, first we have to say to ourselves, hey, he's making stuff up. How do I know that the called out ones are not everybody in the, in the, in the congregation in Jesus? How, how do you know that? Well, because you just read. Okay, so don't believe me. That's okay. I'm just an idiot. But wait, what about Romans 1? Let's go to Romans 1. You may have heard of Paul. He's pretty genius. Even if he's not, it doesn't matter because God spoke to him and through him. Holy Spirit told him to write this. Even though he was a genius, he didn't write this. Holy Spirit told him, write this. He goes, oh, yes, sir. So he wrote in verse 7 of chapter 1 of Romans, I, I didn't write this. He said, to all who are in Rome, the beloved of God. So the beloved of God in Rome, he said, constituted holy ones. It says in the right side, left side of your margin, it says, called saints. Excuse me? He says in verse 7, called saints, favor to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So for those who say, the call to everybody in the whole world, then who are called saints? I'm listening. Go ahead. What do you got there, preacher man? What do you got there, guy on the radio telling me the whole world's called in the love of Jesus. And when you believe in Jesus, then you're called out. Then why is there a verse in the Bible in Romans 1, 7, why does he say called saints? Who are they? If I'm called out, then how am I? Saint can't be a person who doesn't know Jesus. That's a person who knows Jesus. He even said so in the actual verse. Peace to you and God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. So they know Jesus is. So how are they called in Jesus and called a saint when you told me the word called is associated with everybody in the whole planet who is called to know who God is? And they reject him, and that's how they're not called. And those who receive Jesus, those who are called. But, 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 but what? This is how they explain this, by the way. They go, oh, no, no. This just means that they were called and they became believers in Jesus. That's why they're, that's why they're called saints. No, no, no. No, they're clay toying. God, he tells you that. By the way, to explain even further, go to 1 Corinthians. Again, uh, 1 Corinthians. <clears throat> and I want you to see something else uh, in verse chapter 1 of 1 Corinthians. For those who go, oh, those are just called saints. And, and these are just called saints, not... These are saints. Uh, they're called saints because everybody who's called, and those who reject Jesus are just called and not saints. And those who receive Jesus are called, and that's why they are saints. And by the phrase, called saints. What? N no. Well, watch this. But don't, don't believe me. Again, Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. Paul, a called, here it goes again with this word, Paul, a called apostle. Same thing he said in Romans 1 as well, by the way, in verse 1. By the will of God and Suthenis, the brother, to that congregation, or called out ones, of God, which is in Corinth, having been sanctified and anointed Jesus, called holy ones, watch this now, with, 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 not, not same, not same, not same, with all those who are calling the name of our Lord Jesus Christ in every place. There's an arch. So Paul, I didn't, Paul seems to be clearly saying there's called saints and there's those who are calling on the name of the Lord. Um, what, what? I was told by the preacher in seminary that called means everybody who receives, who, who, who hears about the love of Jesus and you just reject it or believe it. And then you're going to, Trip, trip yourself up in Romans 1, 7 and go, oh, well, the called saints is those who were called by God, but they believe in Jesus. Okay, then who are those that are in, in, in 1 Corinthians 1, 2, who are calling on the name of the Lord? Who are they? Because they're separate from those who are named called saints. You got issues, don't you? Because you don't understand. You could be a saint, but not called. That's right. They don't get it. That's why Romans 8, 28, which is used bastardized wrongly, if you understood it correctly, go to Roman, Romans 8, 28, and you can understand this. Romans 8, 28, when they use this verse all the time incorrectly, they'll say, oh, we know that all things work together for good to those who, are, those who love God, those being invited according to a purpose. So they see this word invited or called to a purpose. They say, oh, you see, all things work together for good to those who are in Christ, that, they, that they'll say. But wait a minute. The first part of the verse, I, again, I, I guess why I didn't write this. Paul wrote through the, apostle, through, through the apostle Paul, through the Holy Spirit, telling him what to write. All things work together for good to those who are who, who love God? Wait, 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 wait. But Jesus said those who love me are those who obey me. Wait a second. That's already a distinction of those in Christ. There's many in Christ who don't obey. You know, the ones in 1 Corinthians 3, Paul called them carnal. You know, those guys. You know, you don't understand this? Really? 
Did the apostles always obey Jesus? No, they didn't. They didn't listen to him. He said, I'm going to go up and be betrayed. Y'all need to step back. Peter said, no, not me. I'm going to make sure. Well, that's not obeying Jesus. He just told you. What, what he, he called him Satan, as a matter of fact, to make it clear to him he wasn't obeying him. So none of us obey God all the time. But here we have this phrasing about all things work together for good, Romans 8, 28, to those who love God. And Jesus in John 14, 21 said, who has my commandments and he keeps them is he that loves me. So Jesus defines love, O-B-E-Y, and the preacher from the pulpit is telling me that in Romans 8, 28, that's irrelevant what Jesus said. Ignore who, 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 what God said. No, I'm not. Sorry. No, I'm not. No, hear me. No, why? Why? Why would I do that? Because we have a tradition, and I'm telling you, we all believe Romans 8, 28 is for everybody in Christ. Well, that's not how Jesus wrote it. He, it says to those who love God. If you compare that to John 14, 21, that's a person who knows who Jesus is and obeys him. So what it should say, transliterated, and we know that all things work together for good to those who know who God is and obey Him, translated, love God, to those, meaning those I just mentioned, they're being called, invited to a purpose. Exactly. Because those who are obedient are called. They're called ones. You're in Christ, and you become, you become a called one when you're actually walking in obedience to what God has you to do. How's that hard to understand? They go, no, I don't want to. I don't want to. Because if that's true, then the called out are not everybody in the church. Oh, no. So what? Oh, no. You're wrong. So what? Change your attitude. Change your thoughts. You're wrong. So you go back to Ephesians now, and you'll see more of this. Yes. Sorry. Okay. So in Ephesians 5, in Ephesians 5, let's go back again and see something else here where he's talking about this. But I'm going to show you something else. In Ephesians 5, 23, he says, for a wife is, for the husband, excuse me, for the husband is the wife's head. Even as the anointed one, the Messiah, is head over the congregation or the called out ones. He's a preserver of the sumatos, the ton sumatos. Now, soma means body. But Ephesians 5.23 5.23 says he's the savior of the to somatos. You go, I don't understand. Soma means body, and this the suffix tos, it puts an adjective, a verb adjective in place of that noun. So what? I, I, didn't, I didn't make the Greek language. That's not my language. But Jesus used that through the Holy Spirit to write this through Paul. And he said, to somatos. So you're like, I don't understand. Okay, well, if it meant just the body of Christ, he would have just said soma. So why not just say soma? Why say soma tos? When tos suffix always mandates that you're making a verb adjective now in play. Huh? Like if I said, this, this will dissolve in, in acid. I, I put a, my, my pen will dissolve in acid. Then I put it in acid and it, and it dissolves. So I say, I'm, I'm, I'm saying dissolve is the verb, but now it's, it's, I'm describing that it has been dissolved, so I'm saying it's dissolved. It, it, it has been dissolved in the acid. So dissolve is the verb, and dissolve, the past tense, is now describing the verb, I'm describing the pen through the verb itself. So I'm saying it, dissolving, dissolve is a verb, it's an action, but dissolve, past tense, is being used as a verb to describe what happened to the pen. Right? I got dissolved. So when he says, tos, it's a verb describing, it's an action. It's a, it's a verb describing an adjective. But soma's a noun. It means body. So, what? <laughs> what? It means, because you know what he's talking about? He means, the, out, out of the body, those who have been joined together. Well, don't believe me. Watch, watch Ephesians chapter 3. Go to Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 6. Ephesians 3 and verse 6. Ephesians 3 and verse 6, and he says, uh, well, for context here, for this, uh, first of all, in verse 3, uh, actually, both of these contexts are in Revelation, and uh, in Ephesians 5 and Ephesians 3, both have the context of the secret or mysterion that's in view here, which again, we know what that means, but for those who don't know what it means, they're about to find out. They think it means Christ came as God Almighty and died for your sins, and that's the secret. How's that a secret? We all know that. It's not a secret. It's pretty well known. Yeah. I don't understand. But they go, it's a secret. No, it's not. But by verse 3, he said that by the revelation he made known to me the secret as I wrote briefly before. This is Ephesians 3, verse 3, verse 4 now. By reading, which you can perceive, which means by knowing thoroughly, you can perceive, you can, uh, you can obviously observe my intelligence, he says, my comprehensive understanding, which is his sunyami, which means not just a general dianea understanding. Paul's talking about a detailed understanding. So he's, he's, I'm not doing this. Paul's relating through the Apostle Paul, through the Holy Spirit, that the secret is attached to knowing something thoroughly and comprehensively. Does that sound like just a person who just comes to know Jesus? Come on, man. Are you out of your mind? 
just follow the this I mean I'm not just read the Bible and he says and in this and he says he's doing this in the secret of the anointed one he says the word again in verse 4 of Ephesians 3 then in verse 5 which in other generations was not made known to those sons of men is what it should say those it's boy those sons of men as it is has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Notice how he didn't say, and has been revealed to everybody in Christ. He didn't say that. To the apostles. They knew the secrets and mysteries. They were taught that by Jesus. He didn't teach everybody that. Get that through your head. I didn't write that. He wrote that. It's right there. It's right. And the prophet. He didn't say all the Jewish people. And the prophets. So the prophets themselves had a proof. We know this by reading the Old Testament. Only they had an insight to what was going on. The people always go, are you for real? Some would go, yeah. And some would go, what? And they, didn't, they never had a wholesale belief in them. They always had people on the outlier who didn't believe. Or in Jeremiah's case, all of them didn't believe. So when you see in verse 6, here's the, here's the point of this coupling of verses. Ephesians 3, verses 3 to 6. Verse 6 is the real right hook. And that the Gentiles are soon clarinomoi, which is joint heirs, and... Sosoma, joint body. What? I thought it was only one body of Christ. Hey, I didn't write the book. It's a joint body. Yeah, through, yep. And the co-partners, which is Sue Medicoy, of the promise in Christ Jesus through, by means of, the glad tidings. And again, this goes back to glad tidings, or gospel. They think gospel means Jesus loves you and die for your sins. There's many good news. But that's why they said that Paul was set out exclusively for his glad tidings. They don't understand that his, his glad tidings he had, the good news he had, was not just Jesus was Messiah, but that living in Christ, accountable and obedient, gets you not just a station of, of entrance or inheritance on the earth. You want the one in the heavens. You know, compared to the Levite tribes, mm -hmm. to the other tribes, that don't you want God as your inheritance, or do you want just the land inheritance? Which one do you all want? And they're like, oh, we've heard of the land inheritance. What are you talking about? Yeah, I'm talking about the heavenly inheritance, yeah. the Levites have. And he's like, what? He's like, yeah, I know. No one else talking about that. They don't know like I know. The only reason I know because Jesus told me. And they're like, do, do tell, tell more. <laughs> so that's why he was calling it my gospel. Only he knew. And Peter talked about that, remember? So, so, this, so go back to Ephesians 5, and you'll see that in this phrasing, when he says he is the preserver of the tone sumatos, now you can see why the verb, a, a verb adjective participle at the end, the suffix, means it's a verb adjective. It's describing the body being conjoined. Conjoined to what? To Christ and another level. You can be part of the soma. For example, you're, you're part of the soma of Christ, when you actually believe in Christ. Then you're part of the sussoma when you're given the mysteries and secrets. You're like, what? I didn't write that. He, I, the word's in the Bible. You're making it up. No, I'm not. Sussoma is in Ephesians 3, verse 6. It's a word in the Bible. Whether you believe it or not, I don't care. It's in the Bible. Make with what you, what you want to make of it. I didn't write it. But then he goes into this somatos, which has a suffix that means a verb adjective, and how can you make a noun a verb adjective? Unless that noun became conjoined or jointly affixed to Christ in a deeper way. Context was about Ephesians 3, 6, 3, 3 to 6. Then you go back to Ephesians 5. Let me show you about this word, I'm almost being used again, but we're elaborating more on called, called out, and this whole soma and sysoma, body and joint body. I want you to see that. But let's go more into verse 24 of Ephesians 5. Says, but even as the congregation, the called out one, is subjected to the anointed one, so is the wife and their husbands and everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as the anointed one loved the called out ones and delivered himself up on her behalf. By the way, those who want to miss this all the time, it says that in verse 22 of Ephesians 5, um, wives, submit to your husbands and your husbands to, your, to, your, to the Lord. The, way, the verse right before it, though, in Ephesians 5, 21, be submissive to each other in the fear of Christ. Every husband wants to ignore that part and go, submit to me. The Bible says so. Yeah, I have no problem doing that if you're living in submission to Christ. Like, duh, I wouldn't mind doing that all day, every day, twice on Sunday. I don't care if you're a man or a boy or a girl. If you're submitting to Jesus, I'm all day going to follow what you're saying. So that's why husbands have a problem with this Ephesians 5.21. They want to go to the wife submit to me part, but ignore their part. of We both do that to each other out of fear of Christ because you're accountable to your role and responsibility. So why does he go directly to the woman at, in verse 22. Because, because of the order of things. So the order of things is Christ is the head of the congregation <laughs> and, as, and as God the Father is the head of God the Son, the husband is the head of man, uh, of the wedded woman. But in the same nature, you'd never say God the Father domineers over God the Son. That's insane. Mm -hmm. The same way a husband should not domineer over the wife. That's insane. They both are co-equals operating in a different office. That's all it is. 
There's, there is a 100% continuity of love and transparency, and of, that's what that was the Father and the Son, never have conflict. Not even the Garden of Gethsemane could that create conflict. They created consternation and emotional pain for God the Son, but he made it clear for all of us to know he didn't even for a millisecond consider a rift between him and the Father. At the worst possible moment he could have made a rift, he didn't. So husband and wife, he said, take a note. You should do the same thing. And there's no situation you can possibly tell me, well, it's a rift. Why? You got, you're not submitting yourself to me out of fear. You're not understanding your roles each other's have. And the wife's role is to submit to the husband, only in the sense that, again, it's like when you're in a dance, and I always make this reference, but the, the woman never leaves in those old-fashioned dances. But when it's done right, those old, old dances, the ballroom dances and all the different things you learn, when the man's leading correctly, you don't even pay attention to him. All the focus is on the woman. If he's leading correctly, all people talk about is the woman because she's just filled with beauty and grace when she's the following one, but because you don't see her that way. Because when, she, he, when the man's leading correctly, he deflects all the focus on her. Because it brings out the best in it. It brings out the best. It does. And, and then that's how you know a man's leading correctly. Some people think a man's leading correctly when you see him being dominant. No, that means you're being an idiot. Yeah. If, you're, if you're leading correctly, then you should be the one who's edifying your wife. She should, she should be seen in her beauty and grace for who she is. That's kind of how God's telling you here. So, but Jesus said he delivered himself up over, and that means he rendered himself over to the power of another. So Jesus, being God, the, being God himself, rendered himself as less important than us, which is crazy. He's way more important than us. But he put himself in position to make himself less important than, than us, the called out ones, who are, by the way, still the creme of the creme of those in Christ. And he still says, I'm going to render you, I'm gonna render you more important than me. Not everybody in Christ, but those who are at that higher level. But it's really interesting he did this. But then in verse 26, he said, So that having purified her in the bath, that is, that is the, the, the washing of the water, he might sanctify her by the word. <clears throat> and he says in verse 27, now we're on to our text now, that he might place the called out ones, it's ecclesia. Whenever you say the word church, it kind of misleads you. Think of ecclesia, called out ones. He may place the called out ones by his own side, glorious, having no, like we saw before, no spot or blemish. Again, no no spot, no, no espilos, no, no rutias, any such thing. But he might be holy and blameless, almost. So look down also, go down to verse uh, 32. And he says, and this is the great secret. But I am speaking of Christ, I'm concerning Christ and the congregation. What it should say on the left side of your margin, look what it says. Left side of your margin. The secret, this great is. I speak into anointed and into the called out ones. What? If it's written that way in the right English rendering, that would clear all confusion up. But they make it sound like it's concerning the both, concerning Christ. That's not what it says. It says into. I write about into Christ, which means I'm, I'm already a believer, and into a called out one. What? I said, that's a different act. What? what? Don't believe me. Watch this. Let's go back to, again, let's go back to Matthew. Everything's going to start to make sense to you now. Matthew 22. Go to Matthew 22, and you're going to see another verse here that all of a sudden makes more sense to you. You're going, oh my gosh. Well, yeah, when you understand what called out means, you understand this to Soma, you understand these issues of ecclesia. Now you go over to this passage in Matthew after the wedding feast is there and, and place, and God gives out the good and bad. He, he invites those agathos and those who are uh, paneros to come. It's just kakos people come in. It's really crazy, meaning people that are evil. Uh, he gives them an option to come into the wedding because he gives them a garment. It's crazy. But in verse 11, now the king having entered the view of, of the guest, which is at the end of the thousand year reign of Christ, this is the end, and he says, and he saw the man not clothed with a wedding garment. This is where common churchianity in Matthew 22, 11, they'll go, oh, he's lost. How is he in heaven then? Because he's in a marriage feast. And they'll go, um, 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 go ahead. I got all day. Go ahead. What you got? They go, I, 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 I don't know. It, it's, just, it's a general understanding. It, the, the, the details don't, don't, don't matter. Don't get confused. I'm, I'm, I'm confused. Well, because you're dumb. Because you're not thinking straight. Error. You keep on like, they don't want to do with it. They keep going, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, just acknowledge you don't know. And let's, let's have a conversation, help you understand. But no, they're so, they're, so, they're so animatedly dogmatic about wanting to argue with you that I'm making something out of it. What? Every word out of the mouth of God matters, and yet you're telling me not to make everything matter out of God's word. What? Who's the one who's wrong in that situation? It's you. And Jesus said in this parable, he's talking. Verse 1 of Matthew 22 is Jesus talking, just so you know. And in verse 11, the king having entered, he viewed the guests, saw there a man not clothed in a wedding garment. 
And what's he say? Nice to meet you in Christ. No. Hey, 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 you, doesn't believe in me. That's not what he said. He said, he says to him, friend, that's what he calls him a friend, interesting, by the way. Lower level of friend, but nonetheless calls him a friend. And he says, uh, how are you come here not having a wedding garment? And he was struck speechless, meaning he was muzzled, his mouth couldn't open, which is like, uh, hello. So then he says to him, the king said to the servants, bind his hand and feet, take him, thrust him into outer darkness, the weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are called out. Not chosen, called out. Jesus is making the point to you what it means to be in Christ, then be a called person in Christ, then be a called out person in Christ. Many are called in Christ, in Christ to be called to be heirs of the earth, but even fewer are called out to be heirs of the heavens. He's telling you this in Matthew 22. Uh, listen to what he's saying. Just listen to him. He's telling you. Many are called in Christ. You're in Christ, then you're called in Christ to be an heir. You go, oh, good, I've arrived, I'm an heir. He goes, but do you really want to be like the land inheritance of the Israelites, or do you want the Levite inheritance? Because that's the called out ones. Oh, that's the, that's the, the secret. You that see, God, that's that's the what God was trying to show them yes. he did that. Yeah, yes. Clicks, yeah. yes. So that's why you go back to Ephesians and you see this. You put things together and let Scripture interpret Scripture, like we talked about on Friday. Wow. How do you study the Bible? Let Scripture interpret Scripture. You start, things start to open up for you. And then you go over to Ephesians 5 again, and you go back to Ephesians 5, and he says, this is the great secret. I'm speaking, left side of your margin, I'm speaking into Christ and into the called out ones. What the heck? He tells you that. That's the secret. Into Christ and into a called out one. That's the secret. They don't understand that within Christ, there are those that are in Christ, those that are called, and those that are called out. People don't get it. They go all the same thing. No, <laughs> they're different. Yeah. And that's the problem. That's, they go, it's not a secret. Well, no, not to you because you're making everything generalized. But it is a secret because you don't understand the details. Yes? So the so go back to the wedding garment. He was so first of all, let's go back to um, when you have in, in Romans, <coughs> excuse me, in, in Matthew 22, just to give you a reference to that. In Matthew 22, in Matthew 22, he has he has a. Um, oh, let me see. yeah. So in Matthew 22, this this wedding garment he doesn't have. The, the wedding feast was supplied in verse 9 and 10. But then when you go, he has no wedding garments. So you're asking, there's no fruit bearing involved in that one. That's the one that, again, uh, the wedding garment you're given when you start in has to be retained as blameless and spotless. It has to be retained. There's another wedding garment that you make, which he didn't have, which is the one in, which is what you're talking about. He says, not, that one's not in view because he didn't have one. So he didn't have one. So Revelation 19, for example, he's given one because if you don't have one, you can't even get in. But the one he's, he, what he's in, is the second one he's inspecting that he's supposed to make. This is where Revelation 19 comes in, in verse 7 and 8. It says, we may, we may rejoice and exalt and give the glory to him because the marriage of the Lamb. How do I know the different garments involved? Because the Aristons in view of Matthew 22 because of the verbiage. So if you go back to Matthew 22, you'll see that. And if you, for those who don't know this yet, I'll go a little slower here. Matthew 22, you go back here and go to a couple of verses and I'll show you. In Matthew 22, the word marriage feast in verse 2 is plural. And verse 4 is plural. It says gamos. And, and verse 8 is plural. And verse 9 is plural. And verse 10 is singular. What? It's plural. He's the marriage feast of the Ariston and the Dipnon. Then in all verse, verse 10, it's singular, because he's pointing to your point, Brother Todd, that the garment now in view is not the garment he, he got there with. For the, for the to enter into the Ariston, you have to have a garment. But there's another garment you have to make, which is why there's two feasts involved in Matthew 22, Ariston, Dipnon. These are all Greek words, early feast, latter feast. But in, in Revelation 19, 7, he says, we may rejoice and exalt and give the glory to him because the marriage... That's the gamos, singular, of the lamb came, and his wife prepared herself. And that's the wife, the gamos. And prepared herself means she had made herself ready. She got enrobed. How'd she do this? In verse 8. So now it's, it's the, singular. What, which feast is it? We're about to find out. Let Scripture interpret it. Don't, don't believe me. Scripture will tell you what feast it is. 
And it, and it was given to her that she should be clothed in fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen represents the righteous acts of the saints. It's her actions. And what in verse 9? And when she do those things? In the heavens. She's doing that as she's traversing through heaven and earth during the millennial reign of Christ. Verse 9, And he says to me, Write, Blessed are those who have been invited. Blessed are those who have been invited. But there's two callings. There's a calling of the earth and there's a calling of the heavens. So you can be called to understand the heavenly invitation, but you to live by it means you're called out. So now you have They've been invited to the marriage supper, and the word marriage supper here, the word supper is dipnon. Those, blessed are those, into the dipnon of the gamo, singular, of the lamb. So you have this, so he says again, a supper of the lamb who has said to me, these are the true words of God. So this is where you have, again, going back to Ephesians, and going back to the um, Matthew, is yeah, so the wedding garment that she does, he doesn't have is the one that was associated with fruit-bearing works. However, he may have wrote that in there because it represents the garment he had been given, was given to him already, and then that one, he, he, he had a, it, if you don't retain another one, then the one you have becomes soiled, or it's spotted, and that's not good. So in order to retain, to retain the garment you have spotless, you have to produce another garment with your righteous acts. Otherwise, that one gets soiled. It gets, it gets sour, and then that's why he's kicked out. So that's not pleasant. So in Ephesians 5, back to, back to that scripture again, you can see that the, the, the mystery he says is about, he says, it's about into Christ and verse 32 and into called out ones. Ecclesia. And the whole key to this is, is that people understand what the ecclesia is in this particular context. The ecclesia is the actual, uh, the, the actual bride herself. The ton ecclesion. That's how the phrasing is used of the bride herself. Which is right now, she's betrothed as one but she's not separated as the bride until the Masonic reign begins, and she's separated as that. And then Second Peter describes it as a precious faith promise she's given that she will retain her garment and have another one because the faithful ones that that's a guarantee, and that's they're gonna they're gonna definitely be part of the bride. Those who are mature ones, who are mature ones of 30 and 60 fruit, may or may not be part of the bride. But you want to be more part of the bride or Church of Philadelphia, like you said on Friday, mm-hmm. then you have to leave this world as a hundred fruit. You leave this world with a hundred fruit, then you will be guaranteed another hundred fruit there, which then guarantees you the procured bride position. But you have to leave this place with a hundred fruit yield. That's hard to do, by the way. But it's okay if you don't. If you don't, and you're at, as long as you're at least at 30 or 60, you're going to have the chance to do that. He's going to give you like some catch-up, if you will. You have some catch-up time. Jesus is good like that. He's cool. He's going to give you some more time to produce the hundreds you need here and also the other hundred. And some folks will do That's what the parable of the ten virgins was about. All those ones in sixty fruit yield, it's it's all of those wise ones did produce the extra hundred and extra oil that they took might be for the extra work that they might have to do. That's correct. And they need that oil because they might need that extra and, time. And the oil represents the Holy Spirit, who's then always infused in their life, who's the one who does the work in you and through you. So that's why you need more of Him okay. to do that. Yeah, it represents sure. it represents relying more on Him, not on yourself, mm-hmm. to have the knowledge you need to apply the works that, that are that are required. You can't just do the work without knowing how to do it. He, he, he educates you into the work that you can do it in and through his power. And so that's why you need more of the oil of the Holy Spirit and in your life. the foolish ones didn't take the extra. They thought they were done. Correct. This is why Elisha's comment about the double portion of the Holy of the Spirit, he's talking about this issue. of it. People don't understand that. He means what we know here. He knew the secrets. He knew and he understood about the inheritance of the heavens. He understood that. He wanted not just the land inheritance, he wanted the double portion. He wanted to have the extra measure of a insight to God so he could then live by it. He wanted more than what Elijah had. Elijah felt, he's the type of the person who's a lesser level mature person. Did a whole study on Elijah and Elijah. But Elijah represents why he's coming back again, the two witnesses, that's why he's coming back. Elisha represents that soon medical person who's gonna be alive during tribulation, who like comes alive with, he, he, he walks into tribulation like, with not even having these fruit yields, and he just comes alive, and he produced more fruit than Elijah did, if you remember. Mm-hmm. Elisha's miracles were way more than Elijah miracles. And he represents the soon medical person, which is a person who right now understands secrets and mysteries, but at a small level, doesn't have much time to produce fruit from it, and God goes, it's okay, wave one happens, wave two happens, wave three happens, and all of a sudden the midpoint's here, and the beast is here, and all of a sudden God just flips the switch on. They become like the Apostle Paul. Everything just makes sense that God just helps them understand everything about the scripture. And there's no more Bibles, they've all been burned. 
they've been banned. What internet sites are shut down. They've been shut down. And they just, from their own intellectual spirit, God infuses in them the understanding. And then they begin to tell other people about that. And they can't be killed. Wow. It's, it's awesome. That's, so they, they, so that's Jeremiah, right? It's, what's that? Um, that's Jeremiah back in the day. No, that's Elisha. He could, no, not, not Jeremiah. Jeremiah. The what? The Sumeticoi? Well, he, no, he was, he can, he, there's many um, symbolisms of Sumeticoi. But I'm picking, on, I'm picking on Elijah specifically because he had uh, an awakening that happened later because he was actually being trained under Elijah. Yeah. And, and actually, Elijah is a whole story in that, but Elijah was shelved for a while. Then there was a gap between Elijah and Elisha where God used other prophets. He didn't even tell you some of their names. It's like, it's like to imagine a God in the classroom saying, Elijah, you didn't listen to me? Sit. And he sits down, like, yes. And he has to just watch. God used somebody else and somebody else. He's like, man, it just, it just makes him cry. How can I make you cry? I mean, I'm supposed to be the guy. And God goes, it's okay. I'm not done with you yet. You're going to come back in, in tribulation. You're going you're gonna to show. I'm going to give you, like you and Moses are going to have this chance to redeem yourselves. But that's the thing that God does with them. But that's just through them. And that's what that symbolized when uh, Moses and Elijah came down on top of God and Peter saw them. And it, it symbolizes those who are given a second chance to obtain an inheritance, even though they fell short the first time. Just like those who fall short the first time, but given a second chance in the heavens. God is gracious like that. Moses. It's, just, it's just his mercy. Yeah, Moses was in real time not given a chance to inherit. But in real time, later on in the future, he will be. And he will inherit he the heavens. He will. The heaven because he never got to enter. Correct. But he will get because he has a second chance. Oh, and he wasn't here, Levi? He was up. He was. He was up the Levite, yeah. So that means that's why he also why maybe why he couldn't enter because the Levites aren't supposed to inherit. Well, not that. Well, not that though. It wasn't that. It was because he was. He was. He disobeyed God. He struck the rock twice in anger. God told it was a whole thing about Moses. You got to read this. The little, little series on Moses. But the basic summary of that is Moses vents his heart out to God and tells God, "I can't. These people are they're just infuriating." They, they, they anger me, and I, I know myself, I can't do this. I want to just punch them in the face. And God goes, I get it, relax. I feel the same way. They're boneheads, they're ignorant, they're, they're, they're uh, sacrilegious. 100% agree with everything you're saying. However, judgment is mine. You don't do any of those things. You don't act that way. You don't speak that way to them. He's like, but I want to talk to you. Goes, you are to do what I tell you to do. And God was like, so then the conversation happens again. And he goes, God, I'm losing it. I'm telling you, I can't do this. I didn't ask myself to be a shepherd. You're the one who called me. I didn't ask for this job. I didn't ask for it. You, you're the one who came to me in the burning bush. He starts going through this whole, hey, I didn't ask for this. And God goes, whether you did or not, doesn't matter. I'm, I'm, you're saying you know yourself. I'm saying I know you. And I'm telling you to shut your mouth. Control your actions. You know what he did, what you do. The next thing. They, and by the way, it's Moses' defense. They kept on being boneheads upon boneheads upon boneheads. So he just snaps. And God goes, just give him from the water from the rock to strike it. And he was, he goes, he's so mad to people. He went, rah, rah. And God goes, oh, that's it. I told you, you don't do that. And he did it. And he goes, that's it. That's it. You did it in the most demonstrative way. They look to you. There's millions of people you're leading. And I told you that I'm your voice. And you just, you just, you just basically bastardized me. And the person of you, they're supposed to see me. And you just displayed a, a behavior that I told you not to do. And so he, he said, that's it. Your consequence is no inheritance. Oh, by the way, make it even worse, rubbing the salt in the wound. I want you to tramp your successor, and I want you to watch from Nebo as they all go in. So tramp the guy who's going to take the place of your reward that you worked so hard for, and I'm also going to have you watch them as they all go in. Dude, that's just, that's just gut, that's a gut punch, that's man. That's heartbreaking. And then, then, oh, and, then, and then when you're healthy enough that you're not going to die at all, you're totally healthy, you're a sane mind, sound body, everything's healthy, all the, all the water works are working, everything's good, I'm just going to take your life. I'm going to bury you where no one's going to find you. God. What? He's like, dude, that's it. Wait, is that, why, is that why the Michael, the, uh, the Michael wanted to fight for his body? Why, what was yeah, what's the truth? Satan wanted the body of Moses, and Michael said, let the Lord rebuke you, because he knows that the, the, the forefathers of the Jewish people, Abraham and Moses, are the two icons. Abraham's their father, and Moses is the highest prophet. Greater, no one's greater than him except for Jesus. Of yeah. man, he's the greatest. So they wanted to take him and demoralize him. But Satan felt like he could because of how he, far he messed up. But he, but he couldn't. He, did, he didn't. He, did, he didn't. The Lord made it so he couldn't never do that. He couldn't. He wanted to desecrate Moses' body, to insult God's people, to say, "You see, I have your chief guy that you look up to." And I'm how just. Did, is there more details about that? How did that happen? Like, what's that? Was there? Was how like, God took Moses' life? No, no. Like, when when they're talking about that, because they when I read it, it's mentioned briefly. 
how even Michael had so much respect for the presence of the Lord that he didn't curse. Satan said he rebuked. He rebu- he's, no, he's, 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 no, he said, let, let the Lord rebuke you. He doesn't even. He has, he hasn't rebuked you. Let the Lord rebuke you. Michael the archangel is only given the power. It's in my Satan study. I'll give. I'll, I no, mentioned but, he's no, given no. power to defeat him only when God makes it so with other angels in, in tow. My real question is, um, I'll say that to say this. What, what do they mean that they were fighting over his body? Was there like a group of people that Satan I don't know entered or gave him the idea uh, go get his body over there? Oh no, Moses just no Moses. The idea is that Moses knew how much the icon of Moses was to the Jewish people. Satan knew how much Moses's body would be as an icon. If he could desecrate that body, it would just demoralize the Jewish people. So like Satan himself, like the spirit was trying to steal the body. Correct. Oh. He was trying to desecrate it and just kind of, just again demoralize the Jewish people to say, you see, God doesn't even hold your highest person in this thing. Like he wants to physically. He wanted to physically just it. correct. He's all about just taking God's head, head, his head chiefs. If he takes down the leaders of us, then it makes us who are following go away if he can take him down. Right? Yeah. And it just kind of demoralizes you. Like you don't want to put forth the effort. Yes, babe, sorry. Uh, said, do we have any idea how fruit is produced after death? Um, I mean, so again, you have the fruit yield being done in Revelation 19, 7 through 9 of the garments being sown by the righteous acts of the saints. That's from the traversing of the Jacob's Ladder parable of the symbolism of, of that type of, excuse me, uh, we go back and from, we go to and from. So you're coming from heaven, the day, of, the day of the Lord, which is a day in heaven, but on earth it's a thousand years. So you could be gone for just minutes in heaven, but you're spending years on earth. So there's a lot of work you can produce by, by assimilating yourself onto the duties of helping others on the earth to obtain higher levels of faithfulness and walk with God. And we know that's needed at the end of the millennial reign in Revelation 20, verse 9. Many of these sinners come against the camp of the saints that number the sand of the sea. So that evidence at the end, it tells you along the way there's got to be some people that need to have the understanding to obey him. If there wasn't a need for that, then how do you explain this coup against him that's numbering the sands of the sea? Mm-hmm. Those who go, I'm making this up. No, I'm not. I'm, basing just, I'm just basing it on facts. The facts are, at the end of the thousand-year reign, a ton of humans, Revelation 20, verse 9, come against the camp of the saints. Where would it come from? And if they're just obedient, and Jesus even said, as it was in the days of Noah, so should it be in the days of the Son of Man. There'll be folks engaged in sin during the Messianic reign, and there'll be hybrid offspring consequences during the Messianic reign. Yes, there will be. That's why you need people com- to actually help them understand this. They're going to see what they see from the naked eye. They don't understand the spiritual ramifications of all this. So they need people from the heavens, us, when we come back to and from, if we get to that station, to help them understand what's at stake. They're, they're not going to get it. They're going to get overwhelmed sometimes with what they see. Because they're not living by faith, living by sight, as we all do at times, because we're living in a fleshy body of sin and death. We're supposed to live by faith, let's face it, not, we don't do it all the time. We just don't. So, but if you're on the earth with the body of sin and death, or on the earth still around the effects of sin and death, you can still be influenced by that. You look at the people in the Garden of Eden, the man and woman, they were apart from sin, and they gave in to sin. So how much of a shot they have when they have both, apart from sin, and they have sin, and they have consequences of sin, how are you supposed to sit there and tell me they're they could be okay to live for Jesus through all. How they're gonna? They need somebody helping them. So that's, that's where we come in. So that's why. That's why he's. That's where the works are done. Not in heaven itself. It's when you're equipped in heaven to come down to earth to do the work and go back and to and from. So, I hope that answers your question on that question about the righteous act. So then in Colossians chapter one twenty two, when I go back to this word amomos again, in Colossians one twenty two, he says this word again amomos in reference to in Colossians one twenty two. Here you go again with this referencing, but you're going to see about the, the, the congregation a little bit later, but I'm going to show you verse 22, but for context, in verse 21, and you formerly being aliens and enemies in the mind, in mind and in wicked works, uh, he has now reconciled. He says, in the body of his flesh, through death, to present you holy and blameless and irreproachable before him. So he presents you holy and to present you, that means to place beside, it's parastani. It's, par- it's an ongoing sense of being placed beside him, which speaks to with the bride, ongoing. That's, that means it's permanent. And he says, left side of your margin, it present you holy ones and amomos, and anakletos of him. If you read later on and read verse 23, if indeed, see, no, this is how you know it's not talking about everybody in Jesus. How, how do you, how, that's everybody gets to that place by Jesus' side. No, no. He says, if indeed you continue in the faith, founded and established, which means you remain, you get yourself rooted in and you get steadfast, and not removed from the hope 
the hope, which is the heavenly hope, of the glad tidings which you have heard, which were proclaimed every creature under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a servant. So again, those who want to say that's to everybody in Christ, so everybody in Christ continues in the faith, and they're getting founded and established, do they really? Come on, man. How do you not know this? Read the Bible, you know it's not true. And Paul said, who would bewitch you, people in Galatians? So in Hebrews 5, and Barnabas says, you need to have a teacher. You should be teachers by now. You're just on the book of the word. What's wrong with you guys? There's, and 1 Corinthians 3, carnal people, which speak to you as mature, but you're carnal. There's constant scriptures about people lacking maturity. People in Corinth, he ends the book by saying, examine yourself to be in the faith. 1 Corinthians 13, 5. All these different verses people just don't understand. They're talking about people that are in Christ struggling to live their life. So here we have, in verse 23, a demarcation saying, you can have this put aside, placed beside Jesus' ongoing reality, if indeed you continue in the faith, you're founded and established and not removed. That's not something that comes automatic. It just doesn't. If you think it does, you're deceived. There's no way it's automatic. Just go back to yourself and just go back and track to when you first trusted in Jesus. Was it easy, really, to understand the Bible? Was it, though? Don't lie. No, it wasn't. Was it easy to give up sin? No. Was it easy to say no to sin? No. Still isn't, but it's not as hard <laughs> but the, as you get older in the faith. But you just see this. Watch also, just to take a little deviation before we get to uh, the, the Hebrews verse here. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Let me show you this. To show more of this understanding of, of God's, God's word and how he uses this word, uh, how he chose. Remember in Ephesians 1, he tells us he chose us before the foundation of the whole world, he said, to be almost. To be almost. Look in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 27. He says, but God chose. Same word again. So God chose. Ecolato. He chose the foolish things of the world, which means the things that are dull mentally. They don't, they, they don't do right. They know what right is, they just don't do it. And he, that he may shame the wise. Shame meaning bringing vehemently, vehemently disgrace. Vehement disgrace upon the, upon the wise. And the weak things, which is people with no strength, he chose to shame, to bring vehement disgrace upon the powerful, the strong. He's doing the opposite, right? You think you're strong? I'm going to choose the abject weak person. You think you're wise? I'm going to choose the, the, the abject moron. Ha! -ha! And they're like, that makes no sense. He goes, I know, right? That, so I want you to know it's not them. I, I did all that. So it's not me. Look at my life and you go, how could I possibly? You're right. I, I don't know how. I know what I know. There's no possible way. I, my own, would be this. There's no way. Then in verse 28, he says, and I love this part, though, and the ignoble, which means those that, are, that, that have no noble lineage. In other words, your lineage draws back to a serial killer, or your DNA code goes back to some, some, some evil wretch person or gene pool. So God goes, I, I choose those people. What? You know, like that's why God spared Cain. That's why God did not kill Cain, to show even those who have a bloodline back to Satan himself. I can choose those DNA code people. What else you got? They're like, that's make no sense. He goes, I know, right? That's why you know it's all me. Ha ha. And they're like, well, I, I want to do something. I want to be something about the reason why. Mm, sorry. Nothing, nothing about you is the reason why you know. And not why he chose you. Then he says, and the things that are despised. This is even, this is a catch-all. So if you're not the one who's ignorant in thought, if you're not the one who's weak, if you're not the one who has no noble lineage, then he says, okay, you're just outright out of all the despising things and social and structure of humanity, you're just outright the disgusting, you're just a disgusting leper or something like that. You have some like uncurable disease, you're just a wretch, you're just a, you know, you're just a person who the Ebola virus came from you and all the bad viruses came from you, all the plagues came from your family tree. Whatever that is, you want to say to yourself what makes you utterly despised? He goes, yep, I choose those folks too. What? So back in the day, that, that, that was women back in the day, that was folks of different social cultural structures. Back, he said, I don't care what you want to judge people by, everything that you judge them by, cultural, structural, fi financial, he breaks through all those barriers and says, yeah, so what? So what? I choose from whatever I choose. And he tells you why. He says that he may bring, and I love when he says this, and he, he chose again, he says, and despite he chose the God, the things not existing, that he may bring them to nothing. And so that no flesh may boast in the presence of God. That's why he does it. So no one can go, so I can't say, it's my teaching. And if I, did, if, I was at, if I wasn't at home studying in those days, I wouldn't have known this. Liar! I can't say that. There's no way. I, I can never point back to a time when I said, if I didn't do this, and then this, then, then that, I, 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 I did this, then this, and that's when I saw all this, because I, 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 I did all this. No, it's not true. 
I was doing my normal thing. Next thing I know, God's like a pow, like a hammer in my head. I'm like, what the heck? And I start seeing things differently. That God just created the circumstances, the situations. He put people in my path. To, to, I remember the first thing that happened was, I'll never forget it. We had a, we had in our, in our marriage, uh, 31 years, great marriage. But early on, I was an idiot. And I felt guilty because of ignorant things of, that were happening to me where I actually had this one person who was trying to show affection to me who was not my wife. And I'm like, I knew. And she was like saying things to me. I'm like, I don't want that. But then for some reason, I was entertaining that fact that that felt good. That shouldn't feel good. That's wrong. So that was wrong. So I felt horrible just feeling that it felt good. I didn't do anything. It just felt good in my mind that someone else thought I was a nice person, that I looked nice, and, and I was attracted and all that kind of stuff. Just thought I thought that, it made me feel horrible. And so then I just was in this like horrible state of like destitute. And we stopped going to Woodland Park Baptist Church. I just stayed at home, sat in a chair like a, like a depressed duff. Went up to go pee and poo, and I was about it. Ate sandwiches in my chair. I was really just a vagabond. I didn't go to work, nothing. I just sat there like a vegetable, like a just depressed little sucker. And then my wife decides that God's going to move on her to go out and just go exploring, just to get away from my depressed, ugly self. So she goes outside, and then she finds this uh, Landon's Bible bookstore. And I'm like, whatever that means. So she goes in there and meets a guy named Shelly, a guy whose name is Shelly, short for Sheldon. So she meets Shelly, and uh, Shelly's a Jewish guy who believes in Jesus. He's messianic. Okay, so he starts telling him, uh, he, she starts telling him about just things in general, and he starts talking about things in the Bible, and invites us to go to the Calvary Bible Church. So, okay, fine. So we visited, never stopped visiting. First day of the visit, uh, I was like, the first day when she came back from the, to the, the bookstore and told me about this, in my mind, God had put this impression in my heart. You need to get, you need to, get to understanding the, the origins of Christianity, not just go by traditions of man. Understand the Jewish heritage of what you have. And so I was thinking that, and she comes home and tells me she meets this man, a Jewish guy, I'm like, this crazy. Like, that's not a coincidence. We're going to go. So we went and never stopped going. And the first lesson I, I remember hearing about was they kept saying, Jesus is coming, you're going to get judged. Jesus is coming, you're going to get judged. I'm like, okay, I got it. Stop saying it. They kept saying it. I kept saying it. I kept saying it. I'm like, why do you keep saying that? And yeah, I thought about it. I never heard that before. I've heard it, but not in the Baptist church. They don't talk about that every, every single time. It's about Jesus loves you, he forgives you, and his altar call and all that stuff. That's what you get a lot of in the Baptist church. You don't hear Jesus is coming, you're going to get judged. You hear me? Jesus is coming. You're going to get judged. Why are you saying that to me? You mean the whole world to me? No, no, no. You. And I'm like, me? But I'm in Christ. They're like, no, no, no. You're going to get judged. I'm like, what are you talking about? And then, then, they, then that, that opened my eyes, and they kept getting, I can't wait. And all of a sudden, we're at this, what's this old breakfast. And my guys were at breakfast. There's a couple of families. There's, there's Bart and, and his wife, Marty, and then uh, Lynn, and I forget his wife's name, and his other couple. And we're talking, and they go, hey, you think they know? And we're like, what's going on? Think we know what? We're at Denny's, something like that, eating, I don't know, scrambled eggs and whatnot. And they're like, do they know? I'm like, no, no, what? The other salvation? <laughs> what? My first thought was, call, call, <laughs> you know? And I'm like, danger, danger, <laughs> danger, danger. And then they go, other salvation? I go, what, what salvation? And I remember the verse they showed me. Here's, 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 here's what rocked my world. Watch this. I went to 1 Peter. They went to 1 Peter 1 9. Never forget it. 1 Peter 1 9 and also James. Here's where they went. 1 Peter 1 9, it says, Obtaining the issue of the faith, which is obtaining the end of your faith, the salvation of your soul. And I go, what? Say it again? And he, and he goes, no, you read it yourself. And I read it and I went, what? What do you, huh? I don't understand. Obtaining the end of the faith, the salvation of my soul, first Peter, first Peter 1, 9. I'm like, and he goes, did your faith just begin when you believe in Jesus? And I go, well, of course. Then your soul's not saved, does it? What? I read it again. I went, wait, what? It says the end of my faith is when I had the salvation on my soul. And I'm like, um, what? That freaked me out. Right away, I'm like, dude, that's crazy. There's another salvation. Never heard of that before. But it's right there in front of my face. I couldn't. So, so it says, the, my faith began when I believed in Jesus. But at 1 Peter 1 9, it says, the end of my faith, salvation of my soul. Then so it's not saved when I believe in Jesus? He goes, well, does it say that? I'm like, no, it says it's at the end. So then how's it safe? And I went, um, I, I'd like to know. Like, what part of me is saved now? He goes, your spirit's saved. What? I'm like, so my soul's not? No. What? So then, then you go over to James. It started freaking me out. Those are the two verses, James. So your spirit is saved so that you may be, you may be more willing to, in, to intake the things that are ultimately... Not willing, able. Oh. The, the spirit has to be saved because you're darkened and dead. 
if your spirit's not made alive, you can't hear from God. And you can't speak to him. He can't speak to you at all. That's what puts you in the position. Your spirit that wakes you. It's right. Your soul. That's correct. Your spirit has to be alive, and it's speaking to your soul. And most people in Christ go, I don't have to hear what you have to say, dude. Wow. Jesus loves me. I'm good to go. And he's like, um, you have to do things. You have to actually obey me. You know. So though, in James, so in James, so in James, this is where he also gets. He saw this part in, part in James. Then James chapter one, and verse. 21 and 22, he said, therefore, discarding, I remember, at this point, I already, I believed in the sovereignty of God. I wasn't involved in that free will of man garbage. But he said, I knew that part, which made this part easy for me to understand. But in verse 21 of James 1, he said, therefore, discarding all impurity, which is filthiness and defilement, and overflowing of malice, hatred, bitterness, embrace with meekness, you know, embrace with meekness, the more gentleness, you know, that implanted word, which is able to save your souls. And I went, What? I go, no, 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 wait, whoa, my gosh, no, wait a second. If you don't believe in Jesus, the word's not implanted in you. No, it's not. No, it's not. It's only implanted in you when you do believe in Jesus. Because it can't be implanted in a sinner. Only a person who's been made righteous in God's eyes through him being awakened by God's spirit. Only then is the word implanted in him. And you just got finished reading. I got finished reading saying that that word is that saves my soul. What? It freaked me out. I'm like, holy... Were you telling me that it's not, so, okay, so how I save my soul is by taking in God's word so it can change my mind and heart so I can live right. And he goes, you got it. And I'm like, O-M-G. Like, I did not know that at all. That's what the first wake-up call was. Now, did I, did we choose to go to Chattanooga, Tennessee? That's another side story altogether. No, I was in a retail situation. I was being promoted. And, and, they, and they said, hey, we're going to promote you to, to uh, Texas. And they go, nope, tickets got brought back. As a cut in expenses, you're not going to Texas. Oh, you're going to Kentucky. You're going to Louisville, Kentucky. Nope. Ticket got called, called back because someone else took the spot. Next thing I know, I got three months later, you're going to Tennessee. And I go, Tennessee, where, why, who? Chattanooga. I'm like, what? I got, I got to pray about it first. And then I said, I need to pray about this. So first of all, I didn't ask for any of this. And this is how we got to be in Chattanooga, to be in that situation I described to you earlier. So back, even back up the truck even more. And we're in a situation like that. And all of a sudden, I said, I need to pray about this and, and ask God for peace and understanding where I need to go with this. And back then, I was young in faith by a year and a half into my faith. And I was like, I don't understand. So I looked at my wife. I said, what do you do, babe? She said, I don't know. What do you want to do? So then I go, okay, so there's, this, there's this big committee of, of, of our, of our uh, regional meeting of our um, company I had to meet together. And the guy that promoted me and was like a father to me in the business world had got promoted to another region altogether, to the northeast. This is a southeast meeting. And so we're all there. And I'm just trying to, I go, Lord, just show me through this meeting. How, I, I did the whole Gideon thing, put the fleece out there. Show me this meeting where I could just know for certain if I was go to Chattanooga or not. And I'm like, okay. So I go there. And all of a sudden, I see Mark Coe. That's his name. The guy that actually gave me a chance to be something on myself, believed in me, and actually fathered me in parental and financial understanding of business. He, he meant everything to me in that world. Not a Christian guy. Well, believed in Christ, but not walking in faith. He's more Catholic. like. But he was really good dude, really good guy. And so just taught me a lot and just mentored me a lot. And then got promoted out to the Northeast in the Southeast meeting, regional. And on a break, I went out to get some, uh, just a break or something. I'm in the hall. It's just me alone. And I see him walk by. I'm like, what's he doing here? He's in the Northeast. And then he goes, he goes I'm just, it's my, I can't even... I just chills thinking about this to this day. He came right up to me like a bullet, just right up to me, just like this. He goes, I heard you turn on your promotion. What's the matter where you go in your life as long as you have the Lord and your wife? And he walked away. And I was like, what was that? I'm like, now you're just being funny. So now I, so I knew God, that was God. So I just right away, I said, that's it. I, I right, that very same day, I went to the guy, the regional, and said, I'll take the position because of what he just said. After, I mean, the next day, I told him what, what would happen. She's oh. I'm like, yeah. So all that, so think about that. I didn't ask to go into the retail situation to be promoted, and I got promoted. And then I got this situation happened, all these different places I could have gone to didn't happen. And this, all, these, all these different variables had to fall in line for us to even go to Chattanooga, Tennessee. Then the marital situation had to happen for me to be an idiot. And then to be, to be made Shelly, and then to be, you know, all God used all of that. If, it wasn't, if one of those things is different, I don't know what I know now. There's no way. Everything God did all that. So that you should say, oh, I did it. What did I do? I did nothing. So long for the ride. I said, check, I said, take it on the train. That's all I had. He gave me the ticket on this train ride. I, I had no idea where I was going. So I'll just give you an example. I didn't do any of this. I came to know what I know. I just don't. I, have nothing. I know that for a fact. Yes? God said James 1.21. Yep. James 1.21. So again, he says that you have, because in verse 22, he says, but become not doers of the word, 
and, and not he, not, so become doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourself. Which is why people just they don't they don't do they want to hear and be academia and knowledge wise but not do what they're saying. You know, that's the hardest thing to do. So I want you to just kind of see that note going, going back. So then you go over to on, on the board I put out here the two somatos and the Ephesians and the Sosoma and Ephesians. I put the verses there for you. And ecclesia means called out ones, and I compared the Matthew and Romans there for you as well. So now let's go to Hebrews in chapter 9. I just showed you how, again, how things are just out of my control, out of all of our control. When God shows you something, he shows you something. I, that's on his timeline. That's on his will. And if you go to uh, Romans, I mean Romans, Hebrews, and also in, in Peter, we're going to see on Hebrews, also in First Peter, the blood of Jesus being spoke of as being almost, like no kidding. How much more shall the blood of the Messiah, anointed one, who through Aeonian spirit offered himself spotless, Amomos, to God, cleanse your conscience from works of death for the service of the living God. Another inference to how when you're in Christ, there's something else you have to do. His blood was not just to get you in Christ. If that was the case, why did he say it's also, it's for cleansing your conscience from works of death to service of the living God. He's telling you his blood just didn't redeem you. It was the necessary reasons and means for how you live by faith. Do you not understand that? You have to die to yourself and live by faith. Give yourself over to God. A living sacrifice. But we're a living sacrifice, so we can always get ourselves off the altar all the time, which is why he says that verbiage, living sacrifice. We're all going to wiggle off the altar. We go, okay, I'm on there, and all of a sudden we're like, okay, I want that sin over there, so I'm just going to... So, okay, now I'm gonna do my sin. Go back on the altar again. <laughs> That's why we're a living sacrifice. We just don't. We can't stay on the altar all the time. We just can't. We keep wiggling off and you know, un unbinding ourselves. And Paul's like, don't. You just keep going back on the altar, Jack. So, and First Peter one nineteen. First Peter one nineteen. You'll see also he he talks about this about Jesus' blood again, and he says in First Peter one nineteen we redeemed. Well, in verse. 18 for context, knowing that you were redeemed from foolish conduct transmitted from your fathers, not by corruptible things, but by silver or gold, but by the precious blood of Christ, as spotless, amomos, and as spilos. Man, yeah, he's free from all sin and its consequence. That's what he's talking about. The blood of Jesus is, oh, it's unbelievable. So he's, that's obvious how this word amomos is used, which is how you know you cannot be amomos. If it's anything, anything, anything you use to describe Jesus and his blood, cannot apply to you in this life. I mean, obviously, because he's sinless in all ways. How can that possibly apply to you right now? You can be that, which is really crazy, but only through him making that happen for you. That's what's, that's what's the amazing thing about him almost. Then you go to Jude one twenty four. Now, this will make some more sense, too. In Jude one twenty four, the word I'm almost is used here. And Jude is a scripture, again, a, a, a little epistle that's written. People think, oh, it's written to those who don't know Jesus. But no, in the very beginning of the of the verse at verse 3 of Jude he says beloved again beloved that's the people in Christ making all haste to write to you concerning our common salvation so how is that talking to people that are not in Christ he just tells you we have a common ground here and then you go over to you go but that word salvation is in is in a it's, it still says in the plural but it's not it's actually um in, in the in the same because of declension now, but you go to verse 24 of Jude, and he says, "Now to him who is able to guard you, which is the word phylaxe, which is military guard over you, which is real strict guard over you, from falling, which is to again to make you not stumble, to make you stand firm. Who's doing that? Jesus. So Yeshua is watching over you with military guard. Think about that. He's watching over you specifically with a military guard. Like that's like Green Beret, Army Ranger, Navy Navy SEALs all together, and times a million." Google Plex, infinity and beyond ability. Jesus is guarding you like that so, so, you, so you won't fall. How awesome is that? Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. And he said, and to place you blameless, there it is, the word blameless, to place you blameless, amomos, and the word place there is ongoing to place you in the plural tense, and the presence of his glory with great joy. So the only way you're going to be in that place, people say, how do I get to be Philadelphia? Well, how? Jesus is the one who has to always military guard watch over you. But he tells you that if my sheep hear my voice, they, 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 they follow me, right? So he tells you if you want to have him watching over you, you're like a sheep. If you don't listen to him, you're going to get yourself in harm's way. So be, be willing to be understanding how you should be chided by, you be edified and disciplined and corrected by God. Keep yourself in obedience. 
So if you're in disobedience, he's going to watch over you, but now you're getting yourself into consequences. Yeah, you don't need to. You don't need to be doing that. So he wants to watch over you to not do that. So he's watching over you, but now he's letting you go your way. He's like, I, <laughs> you, you, there's a choice you have to make. Yeah. Be accountable. I'll, I'll, if you want to do what's right, I'm going to help you do what's right. If you want to do what's wrong, you to, then, then, then you're not grieving the Holy Spirit. You're quenching the Spirit of Christ. Because now you're quenching you have that, that whole guard, guardianship thing. You're quenching it. He's like, I'm not going to go into sin. That's where you're going. You want to live in righteousness? I'm right there with you. I'm going to guard you to not be taken away from righteousness. But if you're going to go on to sin, I'll, I'll wait for you to come back. Because right now, you're quenching me. You grieve the Holy Spirit. You quench the Spirit of Christ. That's so bad. Which means you dry it out. In other words, it withers. Your fruit yield withers. That's why it says quench. Without Him, you can't produce fruit. That's why the word quench means without water. It means no, you wither without water. You just wither away. So Christ is going, you better come back because you don't understand. I'm the vine. You're the branch. Without me, you can't do nothing. He said that. I'm the one. You don't quench me. I'm the source of living water. He told you that. That's why you water gets cut off. You quench it. You wither and die. You go off in the sin, you wither and die. He says, I'm going to watch over you with military guard, but you've got you to be attached to me. Stay with me, and I got you. Otherwise, you're going off the rails. That's why. That's how you stay in. For the, just continue to walk with Christ. Get yourself indulged in the word, asking Christ how to understand things. Yes? Uh, verse 14. That was verse 14 in Hebrews 9. Then we go to Revelation uh, and 14. And we're going to see Revelation 14 about the second group of 144,000, which are most people think this is the Jewish people of the Revelation 7, but it's not. And to get context, you'll see if you read this in verse 1, for context, verses 1 to 5, Revelation 14. And of course, we're going to study this starting in January, the whole book of Revelation. And I saw and behold the Lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000 persons having his name and the name of his father written on their foreheads. So far, it doesn't really denote if they're the Jewish 144,000 remnant or if it's somebody else. Let's keep reading and find out. And I heard a voice from the heaven as a sound of many waters and as a sound of great thunder. And the voice which I heard was that of harpers playing on their harps. And they sing a new song in the presence of the throne and in the presence of the four living ones and the elders. And no one was able to learn the song except the 144,000, those who are redeemed from the earth. Verse 4, these are those, he's, he's telling you who they are in here. This is where I contend to you, there's no way. These, this, this verse 4 does not describe 144,000. Let's stop for a second and remember, 144,000 Jews, how did they become that? Because 5 million plus Jews are going to be slaughtered and killed grievously. It's a horrible thing. They're going to be slaughtered and killed. Of those 5 million plus Jews, roughly, 144,000 make it down to Petra. They escape to Ammon, land, and then Edom, and then Moab. I mean, Moab, and then Edom, excuse me. Ammon, Moab, and then Edom. Then Edom is Petra, and they get sealed into there. But they are not believing in Christ. Christ. They don't come to belief in him until he comes back, and they say, where would you get those wounds? In the house of my friends. And then, after Armageddon is over, do they get to that sense of, oh, now I believe in the Messiah, who protected us and secured for us a safe passage through, even though our ancestors and our other loved ones just got slaughtered. Wow. Wow. So, in verse 4, he says, And these are those who were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. They are those who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. These, in verse 4 again, these that, whoops, sorry. These were redeemed from, the, from men, a first fruit to God and to the Lamb. And the first fruit to God, no, 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 no. That's not them. Yes, babe. Tracy said, which name of God is Oh, no. No. I would say, um, personally, I would say Yeshua. It's, a, it's his name and the name of God, of, of the Father, on their fed. So it's probably Yahweh Elohim, Yeshua Yahweh Elohim. I don't know. It's a good question. Yahweh Elohim would have to be, I would imagine, both, because that's what the Shema was in Deuteronomy 6.4. The Yahweh Elohim is mentioned in that, which they then changed to Adonai, which we would say Yeshua. So you might say Yeshua Yahweh Elohim is my best guess. But the point in verse 4 is he said they are redeemed as a first fruit to God and to the Lamb. And in verse 5, in their mouth was found no falsehood. Really? How can that be spoken of the 144,000? Really, how? They didn't do anything. All they did was get procured by God to be safe, and all of a sudden then he converts them in one day. And after that, 
they're going to all of a sudden, and by the way, more importantly, we know it's not them back in verse 1, because I alluded to something I said. They, they didn't tell you anything, but they kind of did in verse 1, because they were standing on Mount Zion. Hmm. That's not where Petra is. Sorry, that's not them. They're going to be in Petra, awaiting him to release them from there. Not on Mount Zion. That's the son, that's Sumeticoi people. And why are they on a mountain? Because those, those are the Sumeticoi mountains spoken of as the, as the kingdom's typology and symbolism, which is why when Lot had a choice of land to choose from, he chose the plains, and Abraham chose the highlands. And we saw that turn down. It shows that two people believed in God of covenant. One chose the worldly pleasures over the heavenly desires of what Abram chose. Because he gave Lot the choice. He said, hey, we're, we're fighting in, in Genesis 13. This is not good. Choose what you want to go. And he chose the plain. OK. Well, that's pretty dumb. He chose the pleasures of life. Because then the, there was a happening place. There was party time down there. He said, oh, yeah, I like it. It's part time. Yeah, it's part time. OK, well, go ahead. Abraham's like, oh, I, got, I, got, I got the highlands. And then later on, of course, the rest of the story's history. Lots of vexed soul. His wife's dead, and his two daughters had sex with him. Um, what has happened? Yeah, 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 yeah. How's that life? Would you do it again the same way? Uh, no. OK, that's what I thought. OK, yeah. Yeah, this, these are the 144,000 soon Medicoy people that are the ones that are out proclaiming these secrets and mysteries during the last half of tribulation, because he always has a remnant teaching these truths. We got the remnant now, and there'll be even a small remnant later, which is why I always believe there's more than just us who are knowing this around this world. I don't know who else it is, personally, but I know there has to be. It's not just us. There's no way. Because if in the worst time of all, there's 144,000, there's got to be more than us now. I just don't know where they all are. I, I don't know. But I know they exist. So in verse 5, it's that word amomos. And he said, in their mouth was found no falsehood, for they are amomos, or momoi. That's the, again, free from sin and its consequences, which again, you can't say that about the Jewish people in Petra. They can't be called amomos. That makes no sense. There's no way. It doesn't, that doesn't make sense of them. So, okay, so then, uh, then you have also now going to this anacletos. Uh, this is the phrasing of the word that means, again, to be free of accusation from God. So go to 1 Corinthians chapter 118. Uh, 1 8, excuse me. 1 Corinthians 1 8. I said the wrong thing. 1 Corinthians 1 8. But for context, again, you've got to see this from verse 4 through 8. So 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 4 through 8. Because I give thanks to God, always concerning you that the favor of God, which has been imparted to you in Christ Jesus, because in everything you were enriched, and that means richly blessed. See, richly blessed, enriched. Yes? Okay. Uh, Tracy said, so who is found The 144,000 soon medical. Those who are in the last half of tribulation, who are the ones in 1 Thessalonians 4.18, they get caught up with the meeting in the air. They come from the other side, and they meet the group that already was there. They come from the east and the west, and they meet up in the, in the heavens for the meeting in the air. They're meeting the faithful ones that already went up in wave one. Three and a half years later, or excuse me, seven years later, they're meeting them at the meeting in the air. It has nothing to do with us, that, that first Thessalonians passage. It has to do with that, that occurrence, the first wave and the last wave meeting up. Yes? And then... It is. Correct. You got it. Revelation 7 is the Jewish 144,000. Revelation 14 is a Gentile, or I should say in Christ, 144,000. So back to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and he says in verse 4, I give thanks to you, and then verse 5, because in everything you were enriched, again, richly blessed by him in every word and in all knowledge. When the testimony of the anointed one was confirmed among you, that word confirmed, again, meaning established, out of being established, there's the word X in front of it, out of being established, out of being rooted in you, okay? Every word and all knowledge, out of being rooted in you, 
uh, who in the testimony of the Lord was confirmed among you, so that, so why did you, how were you enriched, richly and blessed in every word and in knowledge which was established in you? It says, so that, what was the reason for that? In verse 7, so that you are not inferior in any one gift. Now, this is where our Pentecostal friends go, oh, I can speak in tongues. No, 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 no. He means the gifts that God gives out, as in the gift of God's understanding, God's gift of his knowledge, the gift of God's wisdom. Things that you really want, that don't ever die off, that always nothing but they grow in their favor because they're permanent, not temporary. Not superpowers. Yeah, not just like the flight of the moon. You're stupid. That's just this is you want things that are spiritually yeah. spiritual gifts, not these whole things we we'll think about in this whole supernatural stuff. Waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will also confirm, which is he will fix you, he will make you firm to the end, irreproachable, anaklitos, in the day. Once he do this in the day of the anointed Jesus. That's, and it may sound like rain. So that's another proof that you're not done yet once you actually get to go to heaven and enter. He's still there. What's he doing? He's confirming you. Well, I thought I was already done. My sin's gone. I know, your sin's gone, but you still need to have more establishment. And what? Do you see him working on the earth? Then why are you stop working? What did you not understand about John 13? No servant is greater than the master. Who's the master? Yeshua. Is he working? Yes, he's ruling and reigning with an iron scepter in his hand. He's doing the right, he's doing his deal. And you're gonna tell me you're just chilling out? <sighs> so that's why you have to work, Jesus. I'm so sorry you have to work. No, you're working too, Jack. You're doing work too. Hmm. Because he's confirming you. So, and but go back, by the way, in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. You'll see this referencing 2 Corinthians chapter 8 about him enriching us. I want you to understand what this means because our Pentecostal friends and Word of Faith friends want to make it into some monetary wealth issue of, of money. And it's not. They're ig ignorant. ignorant. I say ignorant. Okay? So of the whole passage in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 6 to 8, he says, So that we, des we desired Titus that as he had previously began, so also he would finish this gift among you. He would completely accomplish this gift. Really? Does that sound like a salvation by grace through faith message? He's talking to people who already believe in Christ. He has to finish a gift. What gift? What we're talking about right now. The secrets and mysteries is a gift that God gives to the only those he determines to have. It's a gift. And he was sending Titus to give them that gift of understanding, of knowledge of God's mysteries and secrets. But don't believe me. Let's keep reading. But in verse 7, he says uh, the context is about this gift being finished, being completely accomplished. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 6, verse 7. But as you abound in everything, clearly as believers, in faith and in word and in, and in knowledge and in all earnestness, which means speedy diligence, and your love to us, see that you abound in this free gift also. Does that sound like salvation by grace through faith? He's talking to clearly people that know Jesus and they're growing in their knowledge of who God is. And the free gifts, it's, talking about, it's not the salvation by grace through faith, it's, a, it's, the, it's the message of the salvation's inheritances among the mysteries and secrets. Grow in the knowledge of what's out ahead for you. Understand this, guys. In verse 8 of First Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 8, verse 8, I do not speak this by commandment, but through earnestness. Here's that phrase. Through speedy, again, through speedy diligence. Because Paul doesn't know when your life's going to end and when Jesus is going to come back. Whenever that happens. So you do everything now. Act like it's going to be tomorrow, the next moment. You never know. Of others, I am testing also the reality of your love. He's testing the reality, which means he's testing the out of the, the word here for the reality is this, it's the word for the notion, out of what I can see, out of what I can experience by knowing your love. He said, I'm, I'm testing this. I'm vetting you basically by how I see. So then in verse 9, for you know that the favor of the Lord Jesus, that being rich, yet on your account, he was made poor, so that by his poverty, you might be enriched. Understand our word of faith, Pentecostal abject morons, this has nothing to do with currency and cars and houses. It has to do with the context, all back in verse 7, of faith and the word and in knowledge and earnestness of abounding in love. Get that through your head. That's what the context is about. So the riching that God Christ did for us by becoming poor, was he rich in, in, in dollar bills up in heaven? No! So stupid. It's so dumb. What was he rich in? Wisdom and knowledge of Almighty God. And he came here and humbled himself to die for us to impart to you the insight to who he is. And everything about the heavenlies is beyond our comprehension. And only gave a few people the insight and he calls it a gift. What? It's a gift. Not just to know him, but it's a gift to know him in a deeper way. 
and they don't understand it. But that's what Second Corinthians shows you in chapter eight, verses six to nine. So back in verse five of First Corinthians one, when he says, "Because in everything you've been enriched by Him," understand what that's talking about. You were only enriched by Him. You were richly blessed because He had to become poor for you to be enriched. Do you understand that? Yes. So if you have the knowledge of mysteries and secrets, it's not because God just chose you. It's how he chose you. He had to give up everything he had to give you what you have. So he had to die vicariously, brutally. He had to die a betrayal of a death. He had to die a vicarious, awful death. All that had to happen. He had to be as a human being, experiencing pain and anguish and doubts and, and, and naysayers. He had to experience all of that so that he could then die to then divulge unto a few in Christ the mysteries and secrets, which he calls being enriched in faith and in word and in knowledge and be established in his love abounding. It's crazy. And then in verse 8, he says, in 1 Corinthians 8, of 1 8, he does all this because he was going to again confirm you to the end, irreproachable or anakletos in the day, in his day, in the Messianic reign. Yes? No, the difference is that, and the, the only difference is that in in, uh, in six, he's speaking of the secrets and mysteries being a gift, but and he says free gift in verse seven. He's emphasizing that it wasn't of our uh, obtaining of our own will or our own actions or our own might that God chose us to know the secrets and mysteries. So it's a gift that God gave it to us, but He wants us to know it's a gift He gave to us, not on our own merits of what we were, what we've become. What tribe we came from is irrelevant. He's letting you know it's a free gift. He's impartial at how he gave it out. It's based on him. So it's a gift he gives out with the mystery of secrets. And he goes on to say it's a free gift. Good point you're making. He wants you to know it's free from all human connection of who I was or who I am. And Oh, because I'm a man, because I'm a woman, because I'm a this, or that. No, none of, that's, none of that matters. Like, wow, none of that matters. It doesn't matter what color your skin is, what culture you're from, what gender. It doesn't matter. God goes, it's freely given by me to whoever I wish. Okay. Sounds good to me. Which is why I've always said to you before, and God says he's not a partiality God. What it means is, in the heavens you're going to see both genders of every culture and ethnicity represented in all the higher echelons, as well as in all the judgments. We're all going to have our gender and culture and ethnicity represented in all those different stages. Nobody has the, has the market on evil or the market on greatness, the righteousness. We're all going to have our similar cultures and genders represented in ethnicities in every level of good and bad. God's going, no one can say, I knew it was always those white people. No, they're going to be all over the board, just like all this, everybody else. Every, every ethnicity, every culture, every gender, both genders, I should say, will be diagnosed in every single, there's not going to be weighted, you know. Well, you know, the only thing you find differently about the gender issue, which I think is interesting, is the women were highly favored when it comes to God's love, because again, they were the ones there at the cross outnumbering the men and uh, at the resurrection, the two most pivotal parts of his life. It's like a Luke 8. They talk about uh, how a lot of women followed him and used their resources to help Christ and the apostles at that time. I mean, the disciples. Was that, yeah, well, they, yeah. I mean, you, you find that uh, he just, I mean, he appeared, when you appear, when you come back from the dead, and you if, he tells you that's, that's, the, that's, the, that's the stamp of authentication of everything in the Old Testament, everything he said in the New Testament. That's the, and, he, and he did the authentication on the day of the resurrection to only the women. That's, that's a statement. That's a huge statement. Like you're gonna say, women don't matter. Didn't, didn't explain that to me. How are six women the only ones who, who, were, who were who were there to see that stamp of approval? I mean, it's unbelievable. It's, to me, it's just unreal. It's unreal. So, if any person is favored more than others, it's going to be a woman a little bit more so because even through them, a, a woman, a Messiah to be born through a woman, obviously, right? Without any any work of a man, there was no sperm involved in that. Yeah. Contrary to our Mormon people, I think there was. No, there's not. It's just Virgin Mary and Holy Spirit, and boom, it's Jesus. You're like, that's crazy. <laughs> so. It's really crazy. And woman at the beginning is the one who was come after by Satan. So she has a little bit of edge on that side of things. Yes? Okay, a couple of things. I, I did read uh, Ken's comment, both of grace given by God. Yeah, no, you, did, no, you didn't, but you just did. Now, Vicki said, I was thinking maybe it referred to a different day in the timeline. No, but it's just, it is interesting to see that, again, 1 Corinthians 1 8, that he says he's going to confirm us on a Cleptos or fix us or firm us up in the day. So, I mean, you gloss over this all day long and you don't understand. But then you start seeing these things, you're like, if I'm all sinless and I'm all no need for doing anything, why are you confirming me for what? 
Like, what's that make? It makes no sense unless there's something else to still endure, which there is, and that is the entrance into thou the inheritance, which is becoming part of the bride. So one last part, we'll go to Colossians 1.22. We already saw it before, but it's here again. Um, Colossians 1.22, you'll see it again, uh, where he says again, the anakletos, which means free of accusation from God and man, and the body, and the body of, and by the way, this is the word sumatai. So this is the word sumatai. He says, in the, in the, in the tone suma, in the ta sumatai, the body of his flesh through death to present you holy, uh, agios, and blameless. You see the left side of your margin, uh, and blameless, and irreproachable before him. And irreproachable, a, a, blame, a blameless is almost, or approach, irreproachable is anakliktos. So he wants to present you with both of these, both of these. So free from accusation from God, and apart from any sin and consequence. That's the bride of Christ. And that's like everybody in Christ to you? No, it's not. It's just not. Not everybody in Christ will have themselves be free of accusation from God in the next life and apart from all sin and consequences because some have a consequence. They will endure because of their lack of obedience to Christ. Paul talks about that when he said the man sleeping with his brother-in-law, let his spirit be saved, but his flesh be destroyed by the Satan, but his spirit is saved in the day of the Lord. I mean, good, great, that's a consequence. What's that? Oh, no, I was going to tell her because we can't see from here to just write it. I'm sorry. I know I'm old, tiny print. I apologize. That's okay. That's right. <laughs> yeah. That's okay. You got a picture of it too. Yeah. <laughs> you can enlarge. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. So, so the reference to all, so reference to all these different words we were talking about here and about why this is all important is again, it all, it all goes back to why is it that that we all think about why, why, why do this? Uh, I don't understand. This guy's talking off his rocker and once we've been Jesus, it's, it's all good to go. We're all the bride of the Christ. We're all bride of Christ and nothing's to worry about. Okay. So I'm with one compelling argument that I can just get you on, because everybody who's believing in Jesus, seminaries, denominations, they all would say to me, I'm asked the question, do you respect the Apostle Paul? Well, yeah. Okay. Would, you, would you say that he was, of all the apostles, um, having probably the hardest thing to overcome, you know, the two years of being a murderous wretch, he had to live with that in his mind the rest of his life, and do, would you acknowledge that Peter said his teachings were kind of higher above all the rest of them? Yeah, both those things were true. He had a horrible, wretched life before, and then you know, he always he was there when Stephen was stoned to death. He was a part of it, and he also was, you know, put Peter's words. His teaching was high above everybody else's. Yeah, okay. So would, would you say that when he writes something, if he says something about kind of alluding to the, the future that matters, would you say that that matters to you? To you then? Well, yeah, okay, okay. So go to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Since he's so important uh, as, a, as a human who's a sinner who God used, let's see how this human sinner that God used, let's see what he says. About, about things in 1 Corinthians 9. And first off, he says that in verse 19, verse 19 of this, he says that, for being free from all, I enslaved myself to all, that I might gain the more. First, this is 1 Corinthians 9, 19. Some folks make this into, I became a biker, 